Hello, I've been painting a turnip 28 army since early 2022, and since people seem to enjoy the pictures I've posted online, I've decided to record a full army showcase. Turnip 28, if you don't know, is a miniatures agnostic, or convert your own figures wargame. The setting depicts a world where an apocalypse happened in the Napoleonic era, and eventually a colony of sentient root vegetables took over, killing all the animals and mutating the land and the surviving humans. All that remains are regiments of soldiers wandering mindlessly through a muddy wasteland and picking fights with each other for no reason. The army list in the main rulebook has six generic units with a choice of three weapon options, then senior and junior officers, and a list of cults or sub-factions, which can theme an army and unlock unique units. Personally, I wanted a large army with a lot of variety, so I've kept the colour scheme pretty generic and added a bunch of different unique units, all modelled to fit with the rest of the figures. I called the army the 112th Regiment of Yellow Bellies, and for basing, the rules leave that pretty open, so I've multi-based them on Citadel rounds. I've kept no more than four bases to a unit, so they're easy to move around the table, but the round bases make them look like they're in a disordered mob rather than an orderly formation. Here's the first unit, the fodder or massed infantry. Most of the infantry done in this army are made with the uh, Perry kits for French Napoleonic infantry, War of the Roses and Agincourt infantry with a sort of green stuff snout on the helmet or something covering the face. Some of them have these horrible spikes coming out of the helmet thing like they've got a mutant face. I quite like this guy He's got a Games Workshop dryad arm and then just a string wrapped around him suggesting some sort of horrible mutation. And I didn't want a straight up uniform but I wanted some unifying element. So for the hats I've picked for fodder it's French Napoleonic Chacos. But different types of units will have different hats as you'll see throughout the army. And then there's a command squad here. It has no impact on the game at all. It's really just a decoration thing with that sort of classic Warhammer unit champion, standard bearer and musician. And I've given them the hats that have the plumes. Would have been Vortigeur hats, but I've just used them as Charcot's with a decorative plume to indicate seniority. And the flag, I've tried doing a flag for just about every unit. These flags are mostly scratch built, so two bits of brass rod, a bit of string in the connection point there, and something pinned to the top for decoration. That one's like a Celtic horn. And then the flag itself is a piece of plastic card with some milliput for the sort of folded ruffles where it connects. The picture on the flag, I just picked a sort of John Blanche grumpy moon. And then on the other one, again another John Blanche thing, uh, War Games Illustrated did a showcase of Blanche's models from the 70s or 80s. And one of them had squiggles on them done with just a pen. So I've copied that into the background of this. It's quite good using a pen for that because it can change direction without sort of splaying out far more than a paintbrush can. And you get that constant width all the way through. Here we've got a second unit of fodder with bows, crossbows and conventional weapons. I thought I'd lost the unit champion's head, but now that I've got footage here I can see that it's fallen off and it's wedged between the champion and the drummer. I've got some of the oldest figures in the army here. It's the stand with the tree head guy and the one behind it with the three guys walking forward. The, you can see the wash was a bit scratchy, it's an oil wash. I left it to dry too long before removing it, and it's got this sort of quite horrible scratchy effect, which, I mean, I know they're not supposed to be clean or anything like that, but it just looks a bit rough. But I'm pretty happy with the shields on this unit. I, I like the gradient I've got in the unit captain's one, and the uh, the other guy, the tree head's friend, with the... Uh, I've quartered it and used sort of textures as part of the heraldry. So there's a uh, some of the Games Workshop crackle paint is part of that heraldry. And I was quite happy with a staff slinger here. That's just converted from a piece of wire as well, but it, you know, it's a weapon that seems to have been used a, a fair bit in the medieval period, and so I thought it would be 
an interesting bit of variety to add. Here's another unit for the same thing. This one's got a few more of the Warlord Napoleonic French and Great Coats. They are great time savers. They're a little bit faster to convert and a hell of a lot faster to paint. They come with a musket as a standard, but you can clip that away and just drill it out. This is where I started uh, adding pins, just twisting them up with pliers, drilling a wee hole and pinning them in there. Just gives it that twisted look. And on this one I tried doing the entire banner with a pen. It just saves a lot of time. So I just did the black pen. I glazed in the colours with acrylic paint and then a white brush pen to do the highlights. I think the coloration is quite rich on this unit. I was experimenting a bit and well I've always used an oil wash that was made from transparent colours mixed to create a black brown with a burnt orange undertone. With this unit I used a matte varnish instead of a gloss varnish that keeps a bit more of that orangey undertone on the raised areas but the downside is there's not quite as much of the darker mass tone in the recesses so it's they're not quite as defined as I'd like them to be and I was able to change to a matte varnish because I switched the dilutant from mineral spirits into naphtha or zippo fluid that'll fully evaporate before the oil paint starts to dry so here's the first unit of groups or Grenadier Elite Infantry. In the game they're a bit better armoured uh, and they're pretty tough melee fighters. So I've given them a bit more of a medieval look with mostly medieval bodies on these ones with the heavier armour. And their hats are bear skins and I've given them a bit more of the, the parsnips that I, I guess they show a bit of status. I picked parsnips as the official vegetable of this regiment just because they're easy to sculpt. This unit is one of the older ones in the army uh, and I've put a bit more effort into the banner than I ended up doing later on. Uh, I experimented putting grass on the banner itself which I don't really like the look of but it's fine. I was quite happy with the guy with mushrooms erupting out of his face and his friend with a little skull shield on, this, on the side of his backpack. Here we've got the first in a run of three Brutes units, which I batch painted all at the same time. And that was a bit of a mistake really, I ended up cutting a few corners. The flag in particular I was a bit lazy on. It's based on the King of Hearts. He's in the illustration, he's holding the sword behind his head, but it gets called the Suicide King because it looks a bit like it's going through his head. I just added some blood to force that off brand interpretation of the original picture. It is a bit flat though. I, at the time, the excuse was I'm painting it the same way as the card, but looking back on it, it's a bit flat. I should have added a bit more shading and highlighting to it. In this unit I've got one of the Age of Sigma Crawl Boys shields painted with checkerboards. I quite like the sculpt I quite like the sculpt on that bit, but I wanted to make it a bit less recognizable by painting something over top of it. I did go in and wash the recesses so you can see the sculpted design, but I wanted to have my own take on it. Judge for yourself whether it's successful or not. Here's another Brutes unit. When I was converting the standard bearer slash unit champion, I was thinking that since these are elite units, they should have a larger than average flag. But I think the eyeball design turned out pretty well. No, the lashes are a bit rubbish. One of these figures is holding up a mantlet. This one's plastic, but I ended up converting a bunch of balsa wood ones as well, and then never found space on a unit stand to actually fit any of them on. But I think it would be quite nice to have a few of them scattered throughout an army. Here's the third in that batch of brutes. This one's a melee unit holding bells. I guess the most noteworthy thing though is the picture on the front of that banner. Just a gauntlet holding a cut pair of bollocks. But I got one of the lines wrong though. I've done it convex when I should have done it concave. And it gives the bag its own bulk. Which sort of makes it look like he's holding the sausage rather than the pair of spuds. I think the painted metal turned out pretty well though. It's got a sense of dimension even though it's got pretty simple brush strokes.
The third type of infantry unit in the game are chaff or skirmishes, and this is two four-man units with bows. They were some of the first units I completed for the army, and I've done them with American Civil War kepes and with no banners, which I think is a bit boring really. I'm tempted to replace all these units with some zouave figures, which have a bit more character to them, and I'd give them a small banner in each unit, and then with the old figures I'd take the bases off, convert them a little bit, and turn them into part of a new unit of fodder. Alongside the two units with bows, I did a four-man unit with firearms. The unit has a sniper rule in the game, so I tried to reflect more of that in these guys. So the original four I gave Dragoon Carbines, that look a bit like the Napoleonic short rifles. And with that sniper rule, they're more likely to kill officers than other units are, so I modelled the unit champion as a headsman. But you can tell I forgot to map varnish out the tufts on his shoulders, and they've got that plasticky shine to them. Quite a while after I'd done these, I went back and did a fifth unit, which was the guy with the jizz ale. It's got a lot more character, and I'm pretty happy with the way he turned out. But if I replace all the chaff with zouaves, I'm not sure what I'd do with him, actually. If I'd try to convert him, or just leave him as is. Here's the first of the cavalry units, whelps, or light cavalry, with crossbows. I wanted to give these guys a fairly formal military feel, so they are mostly the Napoleonic Dragoons those dragoon helmets being their official hat though there are some asian court knight pieces mixed in in the setting there are no horses left so these are supposed to be vegetables that have mutated into an imitation of the animals they destroyed so i started by giving them a pretty rough paint job and then along with the base i covered them in texture paint and roots and tufts there's another unit this one with firearms. I've done a bit more on the horses' heads in this one. That eye and the spiky clump. I wish I'd added something to the back of this unit champion there. Having something behind the rider, a bit like the winged hussars, sort of adds a lot more significance to the silhouette. And without it, it looks a little bit weedy for a champion. Here's a more recent unit. And you can see the thing behind the unit champion does make him stand out a bit more. With these guys I added a small banner, and I'd like to go back and add banners to the other units. And I've turned a couple of the horses into half horse, half earthworm creatures. Some of the other ones were just a little bit too regular. So here we have the first unit of bastards or knights. These guys don't have a uniform hat. I figure they're in a regular unit of aristocrats rather than part of the formal military organisation. I was inspired by the classic Warhammer Bretonian armies and tried to paint each one with an individual heraldry, like they were each their own standard bearer. When I started this unit in version 16a of the rules, bastards had a far beefier stat line than the whelps did, so I tried to represent that by putting them on a larger mount. So these horses are based on 32mm Games Workshop horses. Two of them here are the Skeleton Knight horses, just with Perry miniatures, Asian Court Knight horse heads, as well as riders. It sort of brings them up to Clydesdale size. The guy with his lance raised has to be my favourite figure in the army. I just love the way the silhouette turned out, and I quite like the plain helmet he's got on. Here we've got a second unit of bastards. Firstly, there's one guy with another one of the Skeleton Knight horses. There's one who, actually like one of the ones in the previous batch, has a Pistolier horse with a skull for a head. And then we've got a, one of the Necromunda Sand Fleas. I had to re-sculpt the guy's legs a bit to get him to sit on it, but I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. The lances on all of these guys are brass tubes with spear or polearm heads pinned into the end. A bit like the way I did the standard bearers. Here's the final unit of bastards, this one with firearms. In the game they make far more sense as a melee unit, but I figured these guys can get into position to shoot an officer before charging in. This guy on the flea is another one of my favourites. It took an awful lot of work to get those markings onto the carapace, but I think it turned out pretty well. And I know these bastards are each their own standard bearer, but I would quite like to add a banner to each unit. I think I'd replace the sword arm that this guy's brandishing with a flag for this unit. And for the melee bastards, I've got 
six already. I think I'd just do another three guys all with banners, and so that would give me three units. Here are two stump gun units, and I decided to give the artillery units the same shako as the fodder. I quite like these artillery bases, they give you that opportunity to create a real diorama. So there's a corpse from the Dragoon kit on each of the bases. On the one being loaded, I like the standard bearer looking down at his mate who's just been shot. He looks like he's not too worried about it. And in turn, up like with a lot of war games, if you roll a 1 to hit with artillery, there's a chance of it blowing up. So on the heraldry of the one being loaded, I've done a little dice that's come up as a 1. The limbered up gun's a bit newer. And there's rules in the game for an oxen token that lets you turn an artillery unit into something mobile. I thought instead of converting a token, I'd rather convert the gun itself to be being pulled by cattle. And I imagine this unit champion was disappointed about being assigned to artillery instead of the cavalry. So he's turned the whole gun into a chariot, complete with boudicca spikes and a bayonet on the end of the barrel. Here we've got the first batch of toadies or junior officers. These will be deployed alongside an existing unit. So in some cases I've given them a uniform hat to match the other units. Though in this case with a white plume instead of the yellow of a unit champion. The guy with the longsword and the guy with the axe are just kit bashed from the medieval and Napoleonic kits. There's a dwarf there made with the body of a mantic halfling. And we've got one guy made from a warlord metal Napoleonic officer just with a helmet sculpted around his face and a little shield added. The one figure in this batch that I'm really quite chuffed with is this butcher. He's actually in Knowles' marvellous miniature, which the smaller ones are actually adequately cast. I think he was originally sold as a torturer. I've just sculpted the snout on him and added some stuff to his back, and then added some transparent red for blood once I'd finished painting him, like he'd butchered someone before the battle had even started. I imagine his story being that the army was passing through a town and uncovered a serial killer, then immediately offered that killer an officer's commission. Here we've got another batch of toadies. These ones are the more oddball ones. First up we've got the giant mud man. He's a mithril miniatures mulet, which is apparently an obscure creature from a minor Tolkien book. I just painted the features and gave him the full basing treatment. Then we've got a rooster with a tuft on it. Enough said. And the jester is the latest free Christmas miniature by Foundry. It's quite fun fitting the details on one jester, but I don't know how anyone can get through a full Harlequin army. And the last two are from a Warlord Games Celtic Druids kit. It's the second copy of that kit that I bought. I used it as part of a Dacian army that got me back into the hobby in 2020. The guy with the antlers is actually the only figure in the army that's completely unconverted. I was tempted to sculpt a beak on him, but the figure's so characterful I didn't want to change it. And the guy with the tartan poncho just has a head swap, and I've added that parsnip to his face to give him that a hey, kids get off my lawn vibe. And here's a pair of cavalry toadies. The challenge with these is that the stat line on a toady is far worse than the stat line on either of the cavalry units, so I wanted to make them look particularly pathetic. So for the whelp toady I've given the hobby horse, and the bastard toady I've given the donkey and the flaccid lance. He looks particularly silly with his tiny mount and a unit with those giant horses. These two I was pretty happy with, and they're certainly some of my favourites in the army. And finally for the generic units we have the Toffs or the Captains. The stat line on these guys is much better than those of the Toadies, so I felt free to model them up either as a proper horseman or as two figures. The Cavalryman is just a kit bash from plastic parts, with the head being a quarter inch ball bearing with the eyelid sculpted in milliput. For most of the army I've restricted myself to warm coloured paints, but I gave him a blue iris to make it stand out. Maybe it pops a little too much, but it makes them easy to spot. The infantry toff is a crusader miniatures gentleman pirate, and his ensign, who's dressed to inspire the men, is a foundry valkyrie. She's got a regimental eagle on the top of her banner. And for the flag, I printed out a picture of the Mona Lisa the right size and put oil paint on the back side. Then when it was half dried, I pressed it onto the plastic card and went over the key lines with a blunt pencil and that transferred the art line. There's no way I would have been able to freehand that without cheating to get the structure in place. Okay, now we're into the unique units part of the showcase. Like I said before, you can pick one from a number of cults, and those cults will provide a little bit of background, 
some flavor, some unique rules, and generally one or two unique units. These figures are from the Slug's Lament Cult. It's themed around Napoleon's Imperial Guard, and it gives you a more powerful version of brutes with firearms. It also gives you a free unit of extra brutes with firearms called the Old Guard, which appear halfway through the game. So these are the Old Guard, and at the time when I converted them, there was no skin showing at all in the rest of the army. You've seen a few of the less clothed officers, but those are more recent additions. But at the time, everybody was fully clothed, so I thought I could make them show some skin to make them look more elite. And so the lower halves are from Celtic Fanatics by Warlord. The rooster on this flag was also done with that oil transfer method. I think the back half of this flag looks a bit rubbish, to be honest. In general, Turnip 28 lets you convert whatever figures you want. But the one exception is if you're running Slug's Lament, your Toff and your Toadies must have moustaches. So I've converted specific figures for this cult. The guy with the yellow flag is a Warlord Metal Officer. The sap is just a plastic Perry sapper. And the Toff is another Warlord Metal Officer. He'd be deployed with the Old Guard partway through the game, so I've modelled the Ensign as part of the Old Guard. The pointy moustaches are sculpted with green stuff onto the end of a piece of wire and then pinned in place. The droopy moustache is just a piece of string soaked in sprue goo. So here we have Todd of the Todd's Folly Cult. This is a named special character. In the lore he was a dashing cavalry commander until he ate the wrong thing and transformed into a toad. He also wears a rabbit suit but that's never explained. I converted this from a Burrows and Badgers Toad Animist. Burrows and Badgers figures are a little bit too nice to convert, so I did buy two copies and painted one properly before converting the second one. He's got some plastic Napoleonic bits on his back, and then the rabbit suit is done in green stuff. I'd normally paint highlights on eyes, but in this one I decided to use gloss varnish instead. It doesn't look great with zoomed in footage like this, but in real life it looks quite nice. Here's the next of the named special characters, the Leech Lovers, a half-human, half-leech mutant couple. These are made from silver bayonet vampire figures. I bought them to use separately, but when I noticed how the arms sort of fitted together, I decided that this is what I'd convert them into. I converted the leech parts and green stuff, and those teeth are made from the tips of sewing pins. Paint-wise, I did these guys in red, but hopefully there's enough yellow that they fit with the rest of the army. So here we have two units of St. Alame's rocket batteries. They're a bit like Congreve rocket batteries, but of course Congreve's only loaded and fired a single rocket at a time. And these ones probably wouldn't be particularly safe. I just cobbled these together from balsa wood, with plastic art pipes on sticks for the rockets. I wanted a bit of variety, so I did one fan shaped and one double decker. But once I'd done the double decker, I thought, why not add a shield and paint a face on it? I'm pretty happy with the way these guys turned out and just the opportunity I got to draw some wacky pictures. When I first got interested in Turnip, I was thinking of making a diorama where a trench was being assaulted by monsters, either some kind of giant crabs or giant snails, but I assumed those sorts of things wouldn't be in the rule book. I thought it would just be generic units, so I had no interest in starting an army. One day, on a whim, I decided to actually read the book, and halfway through the cults, there's one that revolves around giant crabs, and the next one's all about giant snails. So from that point on, I was hooked, and I started making an army the next week. But actually, to this day, I've done hundreds of figures for the generic units, and I've only got one crab and no snails. The conversion's based on a children's toy crab. I just had to cut and cramp up the legs to make it fit the base and replace some of those legs with a wheel. Then I replaced one of its claws with the claw from a toy lobster to make it one of those one giant arm crabs. And I gave it some leftover feet from the Warhammer giant kit just to make it a bit grotesque. The guy controlling it's based on an idea I had for that diorama. He's riding a horse, but the horse has had its limbs amputated and it's connected to the crab through wires going from the back of the horse's head into the exposed brain of the crab. Now this one's pretty challenging to film, 
against the tall man, a sort of wicker man, for the uprising of the Laos cult. You can see there's some prisoners in the body there. And the figure at the bottom is based on the same druid sculpt as the toady with the giant parsnip on his base. But that flame looks far better here with the black backing than it ever does in real life. I made this from balsa wood, dry sticks, string and about 20 tubes of super glue. And yeah, I did accidentally get high on the fumes. I put quite a bit of effort into painting up those hostages, which unfortunately the oil paint has sort of covered up most of and blended it together. And there's a little heraldic shield in with the hostages marked with the turnip 28th, the poster boy faction for the game. So this is the Grand Bombard. I always knew it was going to be the centerpiece for the army, but it took almost a year to figure out what exactly I was going to do to make it interesting. Eventually I settled on the fish with a human face, sort of spitting that cannonball out. So the cannon's made out of Super Sculpey, with plastic art fins and green stuff details. I tried to get a realistic looking crane like it would actually be functional. Though this super glue chain is sort of ended up bending and breaking and I had to re-glue it and now it looks a bit kinked. The guy in the crow's nest is another one of those warlord Celtic druids. And those mud men loading it are Knowles' marvellous miniature snow golems. And then on the flag one side's meant to look like a pin-up from a World War II bomber. And the other side's got that half skull. And I've painted a half skull on a bunch of figures in the army. When you're painting something like a skull, an awful lot of the work is just fussing around trying to get each side to match each other. So if you cut it in half down the axis of symmetry, so you only have to worry about one half, it just saves a hell of a lot of time. So this unit's not from the core rulebook, it's from the Mercenary Cult Supplement. It's Johan and his Mercenary Pikemen. Johan's another named special character. He's a religious leader who claims to have the last remaining animal in existence, which is a worm he uses to spur his followers into fanaticism, though it does look suspiciously like his amputated leg. The unit itself is the biggest unit in the game, it's 16 figures, so I did 4 to a base and slightly larger bases. I figure they're similar to fodder, so I gave them the Sharkos, but I added in some ancient Phrygian helmets like the concept art. The pikes are mostly brass tubes with pole axe ends pinned into them, but I made sure to put a lot of little bends in them and then add some little blobs of super glue down the length of them. My favourite figure in the unit is one guy who's clearly just a fodder guy who's stuck his musket on a stick in order to join in. In their background has them being from the ruins of Munich, so for their banner I've had them use the heraldry of Munich City. Though halfway through I did a little more research and that exact picture actually comes from the 1950s, not the medieval period, but oh well. Here we have Alison Mole, another pair of named special characters from that Mercenary Cults supplement. The background has Alice as an archaeologist who combs the wasteland looking for weapons from the world that was, and Moll is her burly assistant. This base is actually half the recommended size, so he is fairly small, but I think that should keep him fairly coherent with the rest of the army. So Moll is a Burrows and Badgers Bulldog Knight, and again I painted one of them properly before doing this conversion. Alice is a Great Escape Games Hitler Youth with Panzerfaust from their sort of Jojo Rabbit kit. The handle of that axe she's holding still has a trigger system in the middle of it, which I forgot to flock over. I started doing the re-sculpting on this in Milliput, and then did a bit more in green stuff, and then I did something I'd heard of a few times, mixing the two into Milli Green. And wow, it's so much better than either of those materials on their own. It's a real shame I didn't try doing that earlier. So Max, the creator of Turnip, is currently working on a spin-off game, Swill, set in an underground industrial part of the Turnip world. And at the end of last year on his Patreon, there was a competition about painting a scab tank for that setting. So this has some factory bosses who have been given the great honour of being welded inside a tank and sent into battle. 
So I based the conversion around a Soviet KV-2 and I wish I'd done a little bit more to differentiate it from that historical tank. It's, it's just a little bit too recognisable. All I really did was that engine box on the back and the two faces sculpted in Super Sculpey and Green Stuff. I ended up winning the heraldry category for that competition for this Mona Lisa showing some leg. I think there are a few problems with that picture though. Her foot's just a bit too close to that skull that's painted onto the shield so it makes it look like the skull's physically real and she's resting on it. And then the dress and the shield end with about the same line. And when I was airbrushing the soot onto that machine gun, I ended up getting a bunch of that on her leg, which I had to try and highlight away. But it's left the, that part of the picture a bit greyer than it should be. Since this isn't really part of the same army as the other figures, I got an opportunity to change the painting style and methods a bit. So for the medals here, I started painting the rust or verdigris in matte paints and only put the metallics in at the very end using sponge stippling. And this one I did with acrylic paints only. I was just getting a bit fed up with the oil wash process by this point. I'd love to build a full battlefield of terrain for Turnip, but at this point I've only done one piece, and to be honest it's a little bit too small. It's a piece of defensive terrain. If you put a full unit of fodder in it, there's not really enough space in there for an enemy unit to get in and assault them. The game uses true line of sight, so I wanted to have something that could cut off line of sight. So I've just got these two slightly larger walls, so it cuts off line of sight in one direction, but not in the other one. And I used some still water effects in the bottom to fill in the trench and make it look like it was flooded and deeper than it really is. But unfortunately, there's a pretty horrendous crack in it. So finally, we've got some waifs and strays, pieces that don't currently fit into the army. Firstly, there's a unit of four rootlings made from Warhammer Dryads. They don't quite fit the concept. They're quite large when they should be really a lot smaller, like Nurglings, essentially. I've seen them made with Games Workshop Hobbit Goblin Town Goblins, and that would be a far better way to do them. I might get a box of those and convert them all, because in the newest edition, they're also six-man units rather than four. Next we've got a Hound Master and his Hound. This was a unique unit for Uprising of the Laos alongside the Tall Man, but as of the latest version of the game, he's been replaced with a different unit. I think it's probably a change for the better, all things considered. The figure's based around a Warlord Games, Ancient Britons Mastiff Pack Master. I've just sculpted a helmet around his head. The man and the dog could easily be used as a toff, and the other base with the two dogs could be used as a unit filler for a slightly larger unit of brutes, which if you're running a band of the worm army you can use an eight man unit of brutes, so they'd fit in there pretty well. Next up is a grumpy mushroom from a blood bowl kit, really no conversions here and I'd just use them as an objective marker, but I'd need to create another four to get a full set of objective markers. And then we've got two snail shells with dryad bits to make little root snails. That could perhaps be an alternative way to make rootlings, but these guys were really just intended as extra details for the bases of figures. I just haven't found a place for them yet. So then we've got a fodder musician. This guy's actually one of the first figures I ever did for this army, but he just didn't fit into the fodder with firearms unit that I did. The rest of the command stand were, wa were walking forward and he was standing still. But a second unit of fodder with firearms will probably be one of the next units I work on, so he'll have a home soon. So I thought I'd better include a preachy slide at the end. If you're tempted to get into the game, this is what a sensible person's army would look like. No more than about 25 figures. A standard game is four troop units, two toadies and one toff. The command stands and banners are purely decoration anyway, so you can just leave them out. And paint-wise, they look great if they're just very roughly painted and slapped with mud effects. The rules are available on Max Fitzgerald's Patreon, but you don't need to pay anything or even register for Patreon. Just do a Google search for Turnip28 Rules, currently version 17, and you'll find the link. 
as to this YouTube channel, I'm currently working on a dwarf fortress video, so if you do subscribe, the next video will probably be very different, though I might do a turnip painting or converting video at some point in the future. Anyway, thank you for watching.